about uh, things ranging from the teaching profession being beaten up in the media, being beaten up uh, federally, state level, and at what point were we going to take a stand, and at what point were we going to say, let's try to bring some respectability back to teaching. 
And so we wrote a long paper about six or seven years ago. And as a result of that paper, we toured, toured around the state to different superintendent groups and we said, you know, we really don't know what to do with this, but we want to do something. We don't know what that is. So from that, the uh, state superintendent group was born. And um, currently we have 178 superintendents in the state who now re meet on a regular basis and we talk about educational issues. And our first three things we wanted to tackle was um, accountability was one, respect in the classroom was another, and school finance was the third. And as we kept going through, we found out the one thing we could all agree on was the school finance piece because we felt it was kind of a low-hanging fruit, if you will, but as we found out, it's not really a low-hanging fruit. So as time went on, uh, we kept advocating for more and more funding. We kept doing some things legislatively, spent a lot of time at the Capitol um, finding out that the Capitol truly is, if you're a middle school principal, you might be able to handle the shenanigans at the Capitol. It's pretty crazy down there. Um, but two years ago, we were presented with an opportunity. Um, Mr. Miles and I, I'm the only superintendent. Mr. Miles was the only executive director on this committee. We were asked to come to Denver and serve uh, on something called the Table of 2018. So what I'm about to show you is not just Fred Miles and I's idea. This was an idea that was born from a lot of people. Uh, and not just uh, Northeastern Colorado, we're talking all over the state. Um, we, we developed something called the Table of 2018. That Table of 2018, um, we wanted there, there were groups in here like special education, there was uh, Stanford Children, there was uh, NAACP, um, Unidos Padres. We had groups from across the state and from different, um, across the table. Wonderful. No problem. So we spent a lot of time with people in the room that historically, policy-wise, we have disagreed vehemently with. Uh, however, the one thing that we all could agree on was the fact that public schools in Colorado are grossly underfunded. Okay? So from that, we talked about a lot of different things. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, two distinct separate things. We need to keep them separate. One is Initiative 93, which is what we're trying to get on the statewide ballot, and the other is a bill that just recently died in the, the legislature, and it was a distribution method, a new school finance law that we wrote. But I'll get to have more on that in a minute. So we spent the last 18 months talking about how can we fund public schools. We talked about the taxing issue that we have in Colorado. And one of the things that we felt strongly about going in is we said we need to do like a, a sales tax increase and we found that the people from Denver said, I can't do a sales tax increase. We already paid 14%. You can't add more sales tax on us. They won't pass. So then the people from Denver said, well, let's do a property tax increase. And we said, being in northeastern Colorado with our farmers, with our ranchers, with our small businesses, and the Gallagher Amendment, there is no way it's going to pass. No way at all if we're going to tax our our farmers and ranchers more and our small business owners more because they historically bear the brunt of all tax increases. So we, we settled on what I'm about to show you and we're pretty excited about it. So I'm going to do a few things here on the background and say the stage of what I'm going to talk to you about. We started out in that 18 months with three core values. We wanted to raise revenue for education, so that was our number one goal. Number two, we wanted to find a way. We knew that the last time that the School Finance Act was ever even looked at was 1994. That was pre TCAP, pre CSAP, pre PARC, pre CMAS, pre SAT, ACT. It was pre all that stuff. So we were operating on a system that was funded for 1994 prior to all of the accreditation requirements. So we needed to find a way to distribute that. The other thing we wanted to do was make sure that we included a piece in there that ensured every dollar that came into every school district 
was determined, how it was spent was going to be determined by the local boards of education. Makes sense because we're a local control state. So, um, what we wanted to do is we wanted to, to look at the tax structure and how we currently do things in Colorado. We knew we had to ask, ask the taxpayers for an increase, but when I show you what it is, you're going to, I hope, understand why we went the way we did. We wanted to raise $1.6 billion. Keep in mind, we weren't shooting for the moon. We have ignored education so long that $1.6 billion only brings us to just under national average spending in the nation. And we shot for just under national average. So, we started out with some belief statements. We believe that every student should have the, uh, every, uh, the same opportunities regardless of where you're at, regardless of the zip code. You should have the same opportunities educationally as in Fort Morgan as you do in Denver, Colorado Springs, Durango, Marino. We, we believe that every single child has got a chance to succeed regardless of where they're at. And we believe that there is a direct link between a quality workforce and an economy that is vibrant and, and can, and can uh, continue to build upon itself. We knew that education was a key driver in that. But here's some reality. This is what reality is up in. You're going to see in media right now that we've said that Colorado is 50th in the nation in funding and in, in education in, in teacher salary, which is not true. It's 39th. But I, I will tell you that where we're at is we're 50th competitively. So the money we make in Colorado as teachers would be fine if we lived in Oklahoma, for example. But because we live in Colorado and our cost of living is higher, the dollars that you make competitively make you last in the nation. Okay? The reality is, is that we're 48th in the nation in KCO spending per thousand dollars of income. We're also 39th in the nation in K-12 overall spending per pupil. We also know that a few years ago we had something happen to our economy where we get tanked. We knew that uh, everyone was going to have to take some kind of a hit in all of this. And so when the legislature came to us and said, well, we want to take some money to balance the budget, and everyone's got to take a hit, uh, K-12 is not immune anymore. We knew we had an Amendment 23 there that was supposed to protect us, but they circumvented that for a little while, and that was okay on our part because we knew that based on their word, they'd give it back to us. But as we got on, we found out that what has happened since the recession is they've used money that is meant for our neediest children to balance the state budget. So in the first year in 08, uh, it says 10, in 09, 10, they took $130 million from education to balance the budget. As time went on, it kept increasing, and now we're currently at an average of about $800 million a year that they take from education. And keep in mind, they call it the negative factor for a reason. The way a school is funded, I have a video to show you here. But the way a school is funded is you're giving a, a every, every district in the state of Colorado is given a base amount. And the base amount of dollars that it takes to educate the average kid in an average district, and that's currently right around $7,000. Then there's some things added on called factors. Those factors are like cost of living, personnel, at risk, um, <coughs> And then there's one other I can't remember off the top of my head. But there's four factors. What they did is they took the money from the neediest pupils who are at risk, ELL, special needs, Title I, well, that's federal, but regardless, they took money from your neediest students to balance the budget in the state. So a quick video that I think is really great to kind of show this was created by St. Graham. And if you had an opportunity, to, has anyone seen this? No, I think I've seen it. It's really great and shows you. Schools are fun. Do you know how your public schools are funded? Most people would answer 
that their neighborhood school is funded with local property taxes. But this is only partially true. Join us for a presentation to learn how the state of Colorado determines how much money a school district receives, where that money comes from, and how communities raise additional funds for their local school districts. We call it School Finance 101, and it is brought to you by Grassroots St. Frame. The more we know, the more we can act to benefit our schools. Well, that was the trade. <laughs> Apparently. Jeez. So let's see here. I have to find Oh, it's right in. It's right in. Right 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 <laughs> All right. Yes. See what happens when you don't use your own computer? School Finance 101, Colorado State, brought to you by Grassroots St. Frank. Many people believe that their neighborhood schools are funded by local property taxes. This may even be why you moved to a particular neighborhood. Yes, that is why I chose my house, for the neighborhood school. Well, this is only partially true. In this video, we will learn how the state of Colorado determines the amount of money a school district receives and where that money comes from. It starts with the Public School Finance Act. Each year, it is used to calculate and distribute funding to Colorado's 178 school districts. This money pays for resources that impact education quality and student achievement. Things like teacher pay, the number of teachers in a school, how many kids are in a classroom, and the diversity of curriculum, electives, and programs. Let's look at three different school districts. The per pupil funding formula in the School Finance Act sets the base amount of funding that will be allocated for every public school student in the state of Colorado. Next, the formula considers each district and adds additional money per pupil based on things like the size of the district, the cost of living there, personnel costs, and the number of at-risk students. These factors are designed to make funding more equitable across Colorado's varied school districts. This is how it worked until the 2008 recession. During this time, state revenue fell, as did the assessed value of residential property both of which impacted the funds available to all public services in the state, including education. The legislature had to find a way to balance the budget. Part of their solution was to reduce funding to K-12 education by applying what is known as the negative factor. Is the negative factor gone now since we are out of the recession? No. Even with a rebound in the economy, the negative factor remains as a tool for legislators to balance the budget resulting in a more than $800 million loss to our schools every year. Over $800 million? Yes, every year. This graph shows where Colorado falls relative to the national average in per-pupil funding since 1970. That's disappointing. Once preliminary per-pupil funding has been determined for each district, it is time to count the students. You may have heard this referred to as the October count. Per pupil funding is multiplied by the number of students in a district to determine the total program funding for a district. This is how much money each school district receives for the year. Okay, now I understand how much money my district will receive. But where does the money come from? K through 12 total program funding comes from two primary sources. First, each district keeps its share of local property and vehicle taxes collected from their community. Second, State sales tax, income tax, and fees make up the difference between local property tax revenue and the total funding need calculated by the School Finance Act. Today, on average, local property taxes cover about 36% of total funding. The state of Colorado must backfill the remaining 64%. I thought my schools were funded by local property taxes, but it turns out most of the money actually comes from the state. Yes, this is true for most school districts. However, property values vary greatly across the state. Some districts have much lower property values, so the local share is quite small and the state share has to be larger. In other districts, property values are quite high or they generate higher property taxes from oil and gas production and the state does not provide as much. Outside the total funding calculation, local voters may approve additional property taxes called mill levy overrides and bonds, which are covered in another video. Now you know how the state of Colorado determines how much money school districts receive and where that money comes from.
To learn how local communities raise additional funds for their own school districts, please watch our video, Local Dollars for Local Schools. Grassroots St. Vrain is committed to... Okay, so that's a real quick down and dirty school finance 101. But the true fact is that prior to the recession, we had something called Amendment 23. Amendment 23 was voted in in 2000. In 2000, we said we were going to solve our educational problems with funding by giving education inflation plus growth plus 1%. And 1% grandfathered out after 10 years. They used to fund it before the recession after your total program. And your total program was your base funding plus your factors and your categoricals. Okay? They used to fund, they used to give you a percentage increase based on that amount. When the recession hit, they said we're only going to give you the amendment $23 on your base funding. We took them to court and sued the state and we lost. They went to the state Supreme Court and we lost. They said that they are fulfilling their requirement on Amendment 23 because they are giving you the inflation plus growth on the base funding. They don't have to on the factors and the categoricals. So then they decided they were going to wipe out that term. They hated the term, the negative factor, the legislators did. Does anyone know what they just recently changed it to? They changed it to the budget stabilization factor. So we call it the BS factor. Imagine you find me out of that. <laughs> so regardless, we know, keep this one in mind, because we're going to come back to this in our mind here in a few minutes, because people say money doesn't matter. More reality, just to reinforce what we saw earlier, the green line is the national average back in 1982. We were $232 above the national average in per pupil spending. And that's important to note because in 1982 is when a key amendment was passed in our Constitution, and that's the Gallagher Amendment, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Okay? But since the passage of the Gallagher Amendment, we have seen revenue streams to education drop drastically. In 2015, it was $2,100 below the national average, and currently it's about $2,500 to $2,800 below the national average in today's date. More reality. When we talk about business, people say operate like a business. And I always say, well, gosh, I don't know how I've operated eight years on seven years worth of money, but I guess we've done that. But they talk about return on investment. I don't know if this is a great thing or not so great thing. But there is only one state in the nation, based on student achievement, that funds their education lower, and that's Utah, they fund lower than Colorado and get a higher rate of return on student achievement. So basically what this graph says is that Colorado is number two in the nation in terms of the amount of money we put into education for the return on student achievement, okay, for our typical student, okay? Meaning that we are doing pretty darn good with what we have been given. Now, look down at the right-hand side. What did I say about the earlier? graph. Money doesn't matter, does it? Where do we take the money from to balance the budget? Is it reflective in the right hand side of that graph? When we are 49th in our math, or 44th in our math gap, 42nd in our poverty gap, and 39th in our reading gap. Surprise, surprise, where do we take the money from? Our neediest kids. I actually was down and listened to um, some testimony a few years or a couple of months, weeks ago about the School Finance Act and I actually testified for it. But there was a, a school board member from Greeley there that one of the board, one of the uh, legislators, legislators kept asking everybody, you know, if we put more money in, will you guarantee the results will be better? And his response was, I loved it. He said, you know what? I can't answer that question because you've never given us more money to test it out. But the only thing I can guarantee is if you continue to de-disinvest in Colorado education, you'll see for sale signs, you'll see boarded up windows, and you'll see towns and communities closing up. So this chart um, is a little more reality. 95% <coughs> uh, of Colorado teachers in the rural areas do not make enough money to meet the cost of living. 
We know that firsthand. Okay? So I have people in my district that have been there eight years now, and I've watched a young couple move in, have kids, pretty soon you have two or three kids. Guess what? Life happens. A divorce happens. Mom's left at home with three kids now. Teacher's sorry. Can't afford to put shoes on kids. Can't afford the health care. Can't afford the, 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 the lunch. So they're on free and reduced lunch now. And they're making $38,000 a year after 10 years of service. Is that right? We just got the dubious distinction of having the 50th lowest competitive wage for teachers in the nation. And that was closed by the, the, the Pueblo Chief. So more reality. Um, over half the school districts right now in the state of Colorado are at a, a four day week. Uh, we are not, uh, but many of our surrounding school districts are. We know that um, Canyon or Pueblo District 60 just adopted a four day week. We know that Brighton 27J just adopted a four day week. And we know that Canyon City is, is adopting a four day week and Sterling did last year. Um, Akron did two years or last year. Um, so we know that those are cost saving measures. Now, if you're already at a four day week, this, this doesn't carry as much weight because people did it a long time before they did this. But a lot of people think that that's a way to save money and, and that's what they're trying to do. But the problem with that is when you try to go to a four day week to save money, teacher's salaries don't go down and whose salaries do? Bus drivers, cooks, custodians, TAs. Well, parents too, because they have to pay daycare for that. Well, the there. reality is, is that we're, we're balancing our budget now off of the neediest people in our district mm -hmm. because they're making you know ten bucks an hour now, ten twenty whatever the minimum wage is now. So here's some more reality. If you look at the Colorado current, the current Colorado tax code. The more you, the, the less you make, the more of a percentage of your salary goes to state income tax. If you're in the middle class, you're paying anywhere from 8.3% to 8.7% of your, of your paycheck goes to state income tax. If you make $1.7 million, only 5.3% of your income goes to taxes in Colorado. Is that surprising to anybody? So one of our goals was to try to bring some equity into the system. So please, if you have questions, please. I've done this a million times, so. This slide, I'm, basically what this is saying is that the rural districts, including Fort Morgan, were hurt uh, exponentially more than, than the urban districts. And that's real. We, we see it every single day. So what we did is we came up with a solution. And that solution is Initiative 93. And I'm going to walk you through three very important phases. There's some, some walkaways that you have to have here. Now, because this is a school board work session and we're using a school facility, I cannot tell you to vote for, I cannot tell you to sign a petition, I cannot tell you to carry a petition. But I would hope that at some point that you as an educator would be willing to consider to do all of the above. So I'm asking you tonight to really understand what this is because people are going to ask you questions. Okay? Three very distinct parts. <coughs> we're going to talk about an income tax increase. We're going to talk about a C Corp increase. And we're going to talk about a tax decrease for our businesses. So we need to understand those three things. So how does this work? The first part is an income tax increase. The way we developed this is we went and we looked at, this is, this is all been run through um, the state of Colorado through the title board. So all the numbers are real, they're in real time. If your taxable income, that is, you just did your taxes, you turned them in April 17, I guess, this year, somewhere around there. If your household taxable income is less than $150,000, there will be zero tax increase on you to cover this. That is 92% of all homes in Colorado. 
if you make between 150,000 and one dollar, I'm just going to round 150,000 to 200,000, your average increase for 3% of Colorado is $81. Now keep in mind, the closer to 100, 150,000, the lower that's going to be, closer to 200,000, the higher that's going to be. I mean, that's kind of obvious, but some people don't understand it's on a sliding scale. If you make between 200 and 300,000, that's 3% of Colorado, it's an average increase of $729. And if you're in, um, let's see, my tax bracket, the 300 to 500. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wake up, you're dreaming. What's that? I said, wake up, you're dreaming. I know. So if you're in 300 to 500,000, your average tax increase will be $3,400, right? Now, don't be shocked because the next one is staggering but it's 1% of Colorado. So you can see that the brunt of this is gonna fall on about 2% to 5% of Colorado, okay? If you make $500,000 and over, the average tax increase will be about $42,000. Now, I see some eyes, oh my gosh, how do you, how do you, that's way too much. You make $500,000, that's dropping a bucket. <laughs> well, my, my thing is that if you make, under $150,000 and you increase those taxes, that may be the difference between keeping the lights on in your house, that may be the difference between putting shoes on your kids, uh, getting gas to put in your car, those kinds of things. The difference between $42,000 and uh, on on $500,000 or more, is the difference between going to Haiti three or four times a year. So it's really, we're trying to get some equity with that. Is this state taxable income or what you this is federally taxable income. So once you do your federal return, uh -huh. and you then get all your deductions, all your deductions, so you may gross or 210,000, but once you do all your deductions, your, your taxable income is 139, so you deduct. Okay, so it's whatever you transfer from your federal income tax to put into your Colorado taxable income that's what gets taxed, okay? Now I lost my train of thought. But if you think that's unfair, the 42,000, let's take a look if this passes, now let's look at those same percentages. We went from middle class still paying 8.3 to 8.7%, we're still paying what we paid before. Those making a million dollars more, 1.7 million, go up to 7.1%. So they're still less in a percentage than what we are. So that's the income tax side. Any questions on the income tax side? Because that's part one. An important number to remember is when you're talking about this, because people are going to see this on the ballot. It's going to say, do you approve a tax increase? You've got to remember that we're descriptive. 92% of the people in Colorado will not have any pay tax increase. 92%. And actually, I'm going to show you here in a minute that somewhere to your tax cut. So the second piece, that was the tax income tax side. The second piece and how we're going to round out that $1.6 billion is we have a corporate structure or a business structure in our state that, or in our country that allows you to be a sole proprietor, uh, LLC, a C Corp or an S Corp. Or there's all different kinds of ways that you can do that. And I really don't know what the difference between a C Corp and an S Corp is, but I think it has something to do. If you are a C Corp, you know you are. That's the bottom line. I'm sure that Mike here can probably tell us exactly what they are. <coughs> Basically, 44 states in the nation currently assess an, an additional C Corp tax. So all I'm talking about right now is C Corp, like your Walmart, some of your bigger ranches, some of your um, some of you will have some in Morgan County, okay? I know for a fact, when we go back to the income tax piece in Logan County, where I'm at, 95% of people won't pay a dime more. And I think in Morgan County, it might be around 96 or 97% of people won't pay a dime more on the income tax, okay? c -Corp, now, it, people thought that if we levied an income tax on top of the federal tax that's already put on C-Corps, that Walmart, was gonna leave the state. Oh my God, we're gonna run them out. We're gonna tax them out. Well, guess what? Currently, we're third lowest out of 44. We charge a 4.63% income tax, or a tax 
on C corps. If it passes, the C corps will go to ninth lowest out of 44. So I'm not exactly sure. Again, we didn't shoot for the moon. Not exactly sure Walmart's going to leave for jumping six percentage points. Just not not 100 percent sure on that one. So what we propose. It's currently in Colorado. This does not apply to S corps, LLCs, sole proprietors. This is only C corps. What we propose is going to a new rate on top of the federal rate from 4.63% to 6%. Okay, with that 1.37% being earmarked for education only. Okay, does that make sense? But let's take a look at that now. Currently, the federal rate for C-Corps is 35%. If you add the 4.63% that we're currently adding on top of C-Corps in Colorado, their total is 39.63% is in taxes, okay? Next year, because of the federal tax changes, C-Corps drop to 21% and stay there in perpetuity or until the federal government decides to change that. They drop that rate to 21%. So now, if we tack our 6% on, that means the C-Corps are now 27%, meaning the C-Corps are gonna actually see about an 11% drop in their overall tax structure, okay? Those two things right there are how we're generating $1.6 billion, okay? That's, that's the increase side. But you can see that it doesn't impact 92% of you, and it also gives an 11% decrease instead of a 12 point whatever percent decrease to C-Corps, okay? So those are the two pieces. Now the third piece is pretty important to understand. This is the third piece. And this is what Mr. Miles and I fought really hard for because we felt like Every time that we pass a mill levy override, every time we pass a bond, we have to look at our farmers, we have to look at our businessmen, we have to look at our ranchers, and we have to say, gosh, you gotta bear the brunt of this. I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. If you think about it, back in 1982, the Gallagher Amendment was passed. And the Gallagher Amendment was passed so that it would keep a constant ratio between the percentage of taxes you pay on your residential on your homes versus your businesses, which are farms, ranches, mom and pop shops, things like that. So back in 1982, they wanted to get this, they wanted to straighten this out, and they wanted to encourage home ownership, they wanted to encourage and then put the brunt of taxes on the businesses. So in 1982, we, we as a state, voted in the Gallagher Amendment. At that time, the residential tax rate was 21%, and the commercial tax rate was 29%, meaning that close to half of your funding came from local sources, okay? But over time, and how the Gallagher Amendment works is that there's this formula that is based on your assessed valuation and, and how much your, your, your property is worth in your communities. They, that sets the residential side. The commercial side was set and, and to stay at 29% forever, constitutionally. So businesses, farmers never got to work. Okay? Houses did. We are currently right now sitting at 7.2% on our residential taxes. Okay? So that's why if you own a business, you know that your taxes on your business are four times the amount than they are on your home. And that is why the local farmer goes nuts when you try to do something with assess with the taxing. Okay? So if this does not pass, there's a lot of predictions that next year, the residential rate because of the assessed valuation is going to drop to 6.1% while business is gonna say 29%. As a homeowner, I'm saying, yes, I'm gonna to to pay less on my house. But guess what? That means less going into your local, uh, local till to then be distributed back out into your your fire districts, your rec districts, and your schools. The problem with that is that because we have something else called the Tabor Amendment, which restricts the amount of money, it puts a cap on the amount of money, revenue, 
the state of Colorado can collect, there is no mechanism for the state to backfill that loss in local assessment, which means more cuts to education, more cuts to roads, more cuts to bridges, prisons, rec districts, and so on. Firemen, police, okay? So there's no mechanism there. So there is a hole in the bucket. Our goal was to put a plug in that hole. So what we did, if this passes, because of this part of it, we need 55% of the vote, not just 50%. We need 55% because of the change in the Constitution of Colorado. We are dealing only with the school property side. We're not dealing with the special districts. We're not dealing with the firemen, and they're kind of upset with us right now. But the reality is, we didn't do that because it's a, a some call it a multiple question thing. You actually have to put like four or five questions on the ballot versus just the one. So we decided to deal just with the education piece. We're saying we want to drop the, the commercial down to 24%, and we want to freeze it there forever, and we want to drop the residential to 7% and freeze it there forever. If this passes, you will see, I have run these numbers through your Morgan County Assessor. You can see what you would save on tax. Now keep in mind, I don't know, I probably don't have enough for everyone, but you can see truly what it's going to do. Now, it doesn't seem like a lot, but when was the last time that you were able to get an infusion of millions of dollars into Fort Morgan School District while well, most of you are going to see some type of a tax decrease? Whether it's $13 or whether it's $300 or whether it's $7,000. Other things come into play. In Holyoke, four or five years ago, they passed a mill levy override. They got seven mills in their community. If this passes, I got a good friend who has a farm out there. He will, he will see a $230 per circle on his corn saving tax. If the local school board then decides, because the state is now backfilling that money, the local school board can say, we're not going to assess those seven mills, or we're going to sunset those seven mills. Guess what now? That farmer now saves $580 per circle of corn. While the school district still sees it is backfilled by the state from the 1.6 billion. It's different. These are today's numbers. These could change a little bit based on such valuations. But the bottom line is, your farmers that are not the C Corp will see a tax decrease. So, questions on that? So, why is it important? Why is it important for us to understand this? There's, there's a couple things. Number one, it's important because we have an opportunity in front of us right now. We have been complaining for how long about how under resourced we are. And quite frankly, when people talk to me, is this, is this as about teacher pay? Is it, well, you know what? We are a resource rich industry. What's our number one resource? It's a quality teacher standing for our kids every single day. And I, for one, will not apologize for giving my teachers a livable wage. I won't. It, in my district alone, it stands to me ten to fifteen thousand dollar per person increase overnight just bringing us to national averages so i won't apologize for that and if people want to say that the walkouts all that stuff was about teacher pay it's about resources i'm tired of my wife coming home and spending six hundred dollars a year out of our checkbook to buy treats to do things for the classroom that cannot be supported by the local budget why, why, why do we come to this? This is a solution. It's incumbent upon us. It will not pass if these people in this room, you people in this room aren't active. It will not pass. Because why? Ron alluded to it. Read the very first line. The Amendment requires we write it this way. 
if you don't understand what this is about, what are you going to do? In the very first one, we will have the pot tax all over again. Okay? People think the pot didn't save us. Pot didn't save us. Okay? So it's about educating our public and educating our people to get past that first line to understand that it means a significant amount of money. And what does it mean for Fort Morgan? Okay? You might ask. So keep in mind what I'm about to show you is a uh, breakdown. If you look here, we took this. So I'm going to talk about that piece is the initiative. That is the citizen's initiative that's going to go on the ballot. The piece I'm going to show you is, remember, the School Finance Act was written in 1994. This past two years, there's been 10 superintendents and myself who got together and rewrote the School Finance Act. Okay? And what we did is we then created a PowerPoint based on $1.6 billion, what each school district would get based on the rewrite of that School Finance Act. So if you wanted to see any district in the state, you can see it. But I have Fort Morgan right here. So one of the things we did is we looked at, since 1994, we've had increased requirements on graduation from career and college ready. We've had, we needed to find a more equitable distribution and adequate distribution, very important. Very important, the distinction between equitable and adequate. Okay? Fort Morgan should be screaming for adequate and equitable funding. Marino doesn't necessarily need because we don't have the ELL services. We don't have the special need services that Fort Morgan does. So we developed a system that sends the money where it's needed most for those students. So I could walk you through all this, but I don't have a lot of time. So we'll get down to exactly what it means for Fort Morgan. That right there is the school, new school finance formula. By the way, it did not pass in the legislature, and I'll tell you why. Every single legislator we talked to loved the policy, loved it, loved the ideas, loved, but the problem was it's an election year, and they did not want to pass something that could potentially be tied to a tax increase. So they values getting reelected over doing the right thing. Mm, yes. All of them. We had over four and a half hours of positive comments on this bill, not one negative, and they still threw it out. But keep in mind, Mr. Miles and myself were on both committees. In addition to 93 passes, one of the triggers is that there will be an adequate school finance act that is also passed that will include increased funding on the base, increased funding on special needs, increased funding on gifted and talented, and guess what? The school finance act that we wrote mirrors it almost exactly. If you look at the 94 act, the 94 act is something they call multiplicative. I like that word. But it's multiplicative, and it means that order of operations matter. In this, this is additive. It doesn't matter where it fits, okay? So, what does it mean for Fort Morgan? And these are based on your October counts. We have 3,500 students. You can see that 334 specialized students. Students in poverty. Now, this is a big distinction right here. In the 94 Act, it was, it was called at risk. If you're a classroom teacher, you know that every single child that walks into your classroom is at risk on some level. Come on, three tiny here. pots of tiny on level, they're at risk. <laughs> I don't care if they're rich, poor, brown, green, blue, it doesn't matter, they're at risk. So we wanted a distinction. We wanted to call it what it is, kids in poverty. Right now in the 94 Act, kids that have free lunch are the only ones that are counted. In our formula, it's free and reduced. Okay? So we want to make sure that's a distinction there. And that's going to help Fort Morgan exponentially. So here's your, your basic numbers. The other thing we wanted to do is we wanted to, if you offer full day kindergarten, currently in the 94 Act, you get reimbursed 0.58 for a kindergarten student, even if you get a full day. In the new school finance act, modernized formula, you get 0.1 or 1.0 for, for full day and 0.5 for <coughs> half day. If you're a preschool, then preschool, if you have slots now, we got rid of it. 
Now it's just 0.5. It's not that lottery slot system, it's just 0.5, and that's what you get, okay? Makes it much more simple. So again, now we're looking at your base funding. Everyone in the state gets $6,500. So now you take your base funding, um, you're excluding your online and extended high school, so your base funding is now $23 million, okay? So now we're gonna add on a few more things here. We want to get, right now, ELL is outside of the, th the formula. In the new formula, ELL, gifted and talented, and poverty are now inside the formula, meaning they can't pull a fast one with a negative factor, again. okay? This is inside the, the uh, um, formula. ELL, you have 609, you get 0.29% of the base. That is a sliding scale for scales of economy. So if I had an ELL in Marino, it would be 0.35. Because you're a larger district, you get 0.9. And if you're insured, you get 0.18. Because you have more and it's economy of the scale, it just made sense. You're gifted talented, you have, and that's how that works for everyone else. 0.15, it's on a sliding scale. 0.13 for poverty. The other part we wanted to emphasize is that special education has historically been only funded at 25%. We wanted to do two different things. We wanted to do a tier A, which is your mild, and that's going to be funded at 0.45. So a special ed student's mild is going to be worth 1.45. Tier B is going to be your moderate to severe, which is going to be 0.95. So you're going to get almost 2.0, again, with 1.95 for your. Uh, severe special ed and your moderate special ed. So now you have what we call your student-centric factors. On top of the 22 or 23 million we put up earlier, that's an additional 6.6 6 million dollars. So now we have our base funding, we have our student-centric factors. We throw in something called cost of living adjustment, meaning that it's sometimes more expensive to live in rural areas, so it cost me $800 just to get someone to come out and look at my HVAC before they even do anything. So we needed to, to even that out a little bit, so the cost of living adjustment is $1.2 million for uh, Fort Morgan. And then you have a size adjustment, again, to equalize some things at $2.7 million. Then we threw in some online, which you guys want to have an online, um, but that's funded at 0.95, and that's a big sticking point with a lot of our superintendents, but it's where it currently sits. Um, and then we had this minimum funding of 95.5%. 14 districts were impacted by it, and it just means that the lowest funded district can't be any more than 5% different than the, the highest funded, or I can't remember exactly. But 14 districts in the state that impacted, it's in the 94 formula. We had to bring it forward in order to get those 14 districts to sign up. And then we got a hold harmless, which it doesn't impact you guys, but there are certain districts in the state, seven of them to be exact, that when you apply this formula, you find out that they actually get less money than if they would have just stayed on the 94 Act. So we wanted to hold everybody harmless and boost them all up to at least their pre-recession levels. We got 178 school districts, 171 superintendents signed on to this and agreed with it. So it was a pretty major feat. So what does it mean for Fort Morgan? Under the 94 Act, you receive $23.9 million. Under the new Act, we get $33.9 million. Is that significant money? And that all comes down to your student characteristics, where you live, and, and, and how you're going to service them in the best way possible. Keep in mind, two different things. This is a school finance act, the other is an issue of 93. This is what we're going to do with the money, the other is how we're going to get the money. But they're all on the same element, or they no, two this totally different element. Element. This year, this is legislative. Oh, yeah. This will gotcha, go gotcha. back. But this will go back next if year. If the issue of 93 passes, gotcha. this will go back and we'll say, told you, you should have passed it. Because they tell us right now that the voters of Colorado have no appetite for increasing so I know we have about five minutes left. I'm going to fast and start drinking from a fire hose. But if you have any questions at all, I'm more than happy to answer them. If I don't have the answer, I'll get it for you. So can we just take ballot or take those whatever those things are? 
the petitions, petitions. Can we take those? How does that work? How close are we on the petitions? Right now, we have until on the petitions we have, we have to get so because of the way Colorado Citizens Initiative works. It used to be we had to get 2% of the eligible voters in Colorado to sign a petition. That, for our case, was about 99,000 people. They used to sit down at 16th Street Mall, get 99,000, that was it. Now, because of Amendment 71, it requires that you get 2% of the registered voters in every single of the 35 Senate districts across the state. So it means that 2% has to come from Gary Sonnenberg's Senate district, which is from just west of Pawnee, uh, all the way up to Julesburg, down to Cheyenne Wells, and back over to Wiggins area, maybe a little further south than that. So we have to have 4,300 signatures in our Senate district. So the problem is that we can get 150,000 signatures statewide, but if we only have 1,200 in Senate District 1, it doesn't make the ballot. So we all have to carry our weight. And so right now, I went to a meeting last week, Senate District 1, we have 167 signatures. We have until the end of July to get 4,300. Now that's 40% markup because we're gonna lose quite a few through not knowing where they were registered to vote, not knowing that you know, uh, that they weren't registered to vote and they just signed anyway for various reasons. Um, but we want to get that 40% markup so that we're sure to have those. Now we're asking for those to come in relatively quick so that we can do an initial look around the state and let's say we're, we got enough in Senate District 1, now I can focus in 35. And we can send 20 people down there and get the 300 day win. Or we can go to Durango and send 20 people down there. Um, so it's really imperative that we get these signatures. Can you tell us, like, so people are looking at you, like, what Senate District 1, what area is that? Um, I actually have. Is it the San Luis Valley area? Is that where it's at? Senate or? District 1? Yeah. That's no. ours. Oh, it's ours? Yeah. Okay. That's Senate District asking. 1 is, is Barry <laughs> Sonnenberg Senate District. Okay. And that is all of northeastern Colorado. It's probably really the largest. How many signatures at this point? 167. But we have, so here's, here's the reality. This is about my 12th community presentation I've done. We have enough petitions out there to have plenty of signatures. They just have to turn them in. Okay. So and where do they turn them in? There's a, you have to get them notarized, and you have to then, so you can give them to me, I'll take them to Denver. You can mail them to great education or to thrive, great schools, thriving communities. They will then, they've got volunteers around the clock down there that are verifying. They're verifying whether you're registered, whether you're right address, and they're gonna give us the exact numbers. So we have a pinpoint on all that. So they want to figure out by May 15th or we're strong we, 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 Yeah, I don't wanna cut Rob off, but I don't wanna get in trouble with that. I'm so, sorry. No, you're fine. I think what we should do, Rob, is basically those would like to do the conversation and get a petition, basically let's just set you up the table out of the front area and go with that, how does that sound? Good? That sounds sound like it. If you're on my Facebook page, I posted a map of Clarentire State. <laughs> I know. So I'll take all my stuff outside, and I've been doing kicked out. So. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming, and, and hopefully we can get this thing done.